please note that this video contains spoilers. X-Men 3 The Last Stand Movie Thoughts Okay, so let's try to start with some of the positives. The whole thing with the cure is interesting enough. You know, you have this kind of... They suddenly have the means of disposing of mutants. You know, they they have a way to take away their powers. And so they do actually use it as a weapon, you know. And you have, you know, the father who doesn't listen trying to force Angel, who almost makes an appearance in this movie. I, I swear, he's got like three lines, and most of his role consists of, you know, stares that are really meaningful. Why was he even in this, seriously? Other than, you know, to have this kind of, oh, I forgive you, Father, you know. And you have the, you know, the father trying to push, you know, he wants his son to not be a mutant. He can't handle it. That's a good enough idea, and it does kind of work, and then, you know, the son forgives him still. You have Rogue, you know, abandoning her power, and it makes sense, because we've never really seen her like that she was one. You know, it makes sense for her character arc. Um, Pyro had a cool enough look, and, you know, got to do some cool stuff, and the face-off between him and Iceman was pretty cool. Iceman completely icing out is a pretty cool visual, and there's a nice, you know, when they battle, you can, you know, you have this nice visual representation, you know, the ice on the one side and the fire on the other, it's similar to something in X2, and you can tell how well the battle is going, you know, much better than when Jean and Xavier are trying to stop one another, I suppose, where you really can't see Xavier's thoughts. I'm, I'm not sure how they would have visualized it, but when you have a battle like that that is very abstract, you really do need a visual. The audience needs to be able to see how well it's going, and really, you know, near the end you can tell, okay, Gene's winning, but other than that, it's just kind of, we're just sitting there looking at telekinesis. That's it. You know, we can't tell if Xavier is, you know, getting through to her. I don't know, maybe some some close-ups of her face, you know, her, like, fighting off his influence. Maybe he briefly takes over something, you know, but I'm already getting into the negatives. Okay. Beast. Beautifully handled. I'm not entirely sure who had the brilliant idea of, you know, saying, hey, how about we get that effeminate guy from Cheers? But the guy needs a medal because it was perfect casting. I honestly kind of figured from when I first read that he, you know, was chosen for that. Just perfect. He's got the voice. He's got the attitude. He can really do it because you believe that this guy is smart. And still he can project some force, you know, he doesn't feel like, and when you see Beast fighting, it is perfect, he's got the dexterity, he's acrobatic, it's just spot on, and the bit with, you know, Logan saying, hey, aren't you a diplomat, and him trying to talk, but then he has to concentrate on the fighting, that was slightly humorous, you know, that worked. I'm not sure there's anything else positive, so okay, let's deal with the powers just having grown exponentially between, you know, the movie before this one and this one. You know, Magneto can suddenly lift a bridge. Okay, he could lift a few cars before. You know, he could do some cool stuff. He could open a train car. <sighs> like it was a hard-boiled egg. But this is just, if he can do this, why has he not done something much bigger before? Why does it take him so long to decide to attack Alcatraz? If he can get Pyro that close, you know, other than doing this really lame 
turning Magneto into Osama Bin Laden kind of thing, what is the point of this? You know, okay, he was already a terrorist. Okay, watch the first movie. He's a terrorist. That's that's what he's what he's doing. It's terrorism. It's just it it was never you know, it's not like he makes that final step into, you know, we didn't need the visual of him in a cave, you know, poorly lit, you know, shown on the news, but then again, it's Fox, so maybe the tape was doctored, I don't know. You know, Phoenix's powers, why does she wait? She waits like 40 minutes where she does nothing between killing Xavier and freaking out near the end and just killing everyone except for Logan, who can apparently now heal, again, a power that's grown exponentially, he can apparently now heal just as fast as she can kill, even though we just saw her take out like 20, 30 people in the blink of an eye. Why does she do nothing for all that time? If she's like all consumed with she wants to devour powers, she does that like once. She, you know, takes Scott's power and that's apparently it even though it's not entirely confirmed that she even does take his power, but why else would she kill him? Why does she kill him? And just in general, all this... You know, why does Xavier blame Logan so much? What did Logan do to release her? It seemed more like she just released herself. You know, and then we have all these hints at the first movie. It's like, hey, hey, you like the first movie, just... You know, like this one too, we have Jean grabbing her. She even points out, this is just like the first movie. You know, we have the... The past stuff before, you know, now kind of thing. Okay, one more positive. The, the bit where Magneto frees Mystique and the others is kind of cool. You know, that's a cool setup. We have this mobile prison and he breaks into this truck. That's pretty cool. Although again, you know, he's he has way too e easy of a time to do this, you know, with the powers. Again, it's it's like in the prequel trilogy of Star Wars, you know, the moment you give someone that many powers, he doesn't even seem to be focusing. He doesn't even seem to be trying hard or applying himself. Are we really supposed to care that he does all this stuff? Okay, it makes for a cool visual, but he's not even being challenged, you know. It's not even a, really an action scene. He's just doing it. It's not any trouble for him whatsoever. I can maybe kind of see what they were going for with him abandoning Mystique, but again, I feel it's out of character. I don't think the Magneto of the first two movies would really have done that, just because she's no longer a mutant. <sighs> Completely abandoning her, and just to, I, I mean, what kind of guy walks away from a naked Rebecca Romaine? I just, that does not happen. Okay, so he's gay in real life, but still, just, that doesn't happen. <sighs> then we have, you know, she talks about where the camp was, and, you know, he uses multiple man as a decoy. Okay, it's fine enough, but again, it's just one of these things where nothing really happens in the scene. It's like when Logan finds them in the woods. Nothing happens. You know, he just chops through some, you know, some mutants that use guns for some reason, you know, because it's always good when you have Wolverine going up against people with guns. That's a cool thing because he actually handles himself without the use of guns. That's badass, of course. And then we have, you know, this one guy who keeps throwing blades of some sort at him. I don't know, is he supposed to be like a Morlock breaking off those bones that grow out and then he just keeps throwing it? I don't know. That guy could easily have been in, you know, a freaking Rush Hour movie or something. You know, just, he's just throwing knives. That's it. You know, that's not that interesting of a mutant power. We've seen knife-throwing henchmen in action movies before. And, you know, he makes it all the way out there, almost talks to Jean, she looks at him, and just, you know, Magneto hurls him away, and that's it, you know. Nothing came of all that. We just had, you know, some action just to, you know, pad out the, 
you know, just to make sure to get some more action in their movie. When the action scene doesn't lead to anything, it just becomes pointless. You know, they could easily have written a more interesting scene. If it doesn't have any kind of real outcome, nothing changes from it. It's not like Magneto changes his plans or something. You know, in the second one, we also have Wolverine, you know, just letting go and taking out a bunch of people, but it's for a reason. There, it means something. There, we just, you know, we enjoy seeing him do that. In the third movie, it's just, it's forgettable. It's not that poorly choreographed, but it's just, it doesn't lead to anything. And what was even the point of, what was the reason for, I guess Jean is supposed to be breaking through Dark Phoenix's control and, you know, screaming out to Logan to make him come help her, but she doesn't do that, I guess, after that point. I think that's the last time the real Jean breaks through, it seems, except for, you know, maybe there at the very end when he, you know, then kills her. It's not like he could have saved any of that, you know, cure, serum, whatever. There was just, there was no point to it. And, you know, when you have this much plot and that little actual action, and, you, you know, you're finding yourself trying to justify action scenes, you know, trying, just trying to inject them without any kind of proper... That's just, that's bad, you know. I, the script was just bad. They should have worked more on this. Then we have the final, the, the climax, the final big conflict, and it just consists of mutants, supposedly, they might as well be regular human beings, just running at troops, that's it. You know, what happened to the strategic Magneto? What happened to the Magneto that did not go anywhere, that did not start any kind of conflict without a proper plan? You know, look at the first two movies. He thinks things through. He uses... You know, okay, so he's willing to sacrifice other mutants, which I also, again, they just make him excessively evil in this movie. He didn't seem to be willing to sacrifice people. He didn't seem crazy about sacrificing people before, you know. He didn't mind killing humans, but that's because he hates homo sapiens, you know. Why does he wait so long with the whole, you know, tossing, burning cars at others, especially if he didn't mind sacrificing all those mutants. Heck, he didn't even need to throw them where the mutants were. He could have thrown them at the building itself. Why doesn't he fly around the building, open up the building, you know, and send someone directly there to grab Leech? You know, the, the mutant kid who, abs who removes others' abilities. You know, it would have been so easy and you know, it seemed like all the actual guards were outside, and he didn't have any trouble blocking all of these, you know, darts with the serum in them when they shoot at them. You know, why didn't he just fly around there? And about the flying, when Storm flies the second time, you know, near the end, that looks okay, that looks good. Maybe this is just me, but I think it looks ridiculous when she is spinning towards, you know, when Jean has went back, has gone back to the, her old house, you know. And Storm is just spinning towards the others. If she was just rushing towards them, I mean, would it really make her go that much faster? How about just supermaning it there or something? Or maybe just running, charging up a lightning bolt and, you know, once she gets close enough, run, jump, to do a lightning bolt midair, that would have been cool. But spinning, with that said, the Juggernaut on Wolverine fight is pretty good. Although it's a lot, it was a lot shorter than I remember it as. But you know, maybe I got a really good impression of it the first couple of times, and you know, in my mind, it went on for longer. Uh, 
has anybody been able to determine if Shockwave is a man or a woman? I'm not trying to be a jerk here, but it's a little difficult to determine with no disrespect meant to anyone who is actually trans or, you know, the other one who keeps fighting Storm and, you know, teleporting or moving really fast. She barely had a character. She was really just there to find Mystique and find Jean, and that's it. And, you know, then fight Storm with the teleportation ability used pretty boringly. Again, it's just this kind of action scene that could... It could have been in any other action movie. It's basically just one person beating up another person because they're faster than them. You know, she didn't even need to be teleporting for it. You know, again, watch X2. Look at how they use Nightcrawler. Look at all the teleporting and what he does with it. Those scenes would not have... You know, he could not have done what he does in, for example, the opening of X2 if he hadn't been able to teleport. On the other hand, you know, the chick who is so forgettable that I don't even remember her name, she didn't need to be able to teleport to beat up Storm the way she did, you know. Okay, maybe to get up to, you know, jump at her from up on the, you know, the roof of that building when the Storm is flying, but other than that, she really didn't need to be able to teleport for all of that to work. The film has far too many mutants, especially at the climax where they are just, there are so many of them and we hardly see any use of powers, you know, we see like one guy who can apparently climb on things, you know, I don't know, Spider-Man's cousin or something twice removed, and he loses his ability, so oh, he falls down, and then there's this other guy who's got like ash something volcano thing going on, who like melts, a, you know, a human using plastic weaponry, something like that. Other than that, it's basically just the mutants we've already seen, you know, including, you know, porcupine guy who doesn't seem that capable of killing anyone unless he can, you know, get nice and intimate with them, which is just really lame. Why was he in this movie? And then just, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens when you try to have this many superpowered people in one movie. You need either a show or two, if, if it's got to be done by movies, have just a few and then maybe switch the focus. You know, maybe if each of these movies focused specifically on one, you know, one of them could have focused on Cyclops, him trying to become a leader. One of them could have focused on Storm, preferably without it being quite this obvious and obnoxious, you know, have something like that and have the other characters just play a role, but don't just focus specifically on, you know, one or just a few, especially don't throw in this many mutants at once, you know, it's just, it doesn't work, it doesn't really you know, okay, another slightly positive, at least, aspect. Magneto giving an inspirational speech. That was kind of, that kind of worked. Even though it's really transparent, but hey, maybe it's supposed to be, you know, when he's saying, ah, they're going to use the serum against us, and then at the end of the speech he says, so we're going to use the serum against them. Yeah, anybody who has just half an ounce of sense there will say, hey, wait, why is it okay for us to use this thing if you're saying that we're attacking them because they're using that specific thing against us? That <laughs> logic, please help me find it. You know, maybe it was supposed to be, maybe they're, you know, it's not unlike some kind of Hitler-ish thing, you know, big inspirational speeches, but when you actually you know, trying to look at what they're saying, it doesn't make that much sense, you know, it, it's just inspirational. And that was, you know, if, if you're going for Magneto as just all-out villain, you know, that kind of thing, that did work, I would say. I suppose that's about what there is to say about it. Not entirely. Why the need to 
kill off major characters, or at least remove them, Mystique goes away. You know, if Mystique wasn't going to play a big role in the movie, then just don't have her in the movie, you know, you dump Nightcrawler without even, you know, saying goodbye or leaving a note. Okay, I get it, the actor didn't like the makeup and, you know, but at least have a line, you know, just have some kind of, you know, explanation, just a single line, it's all I'm asking. Mystique disappears, you know, Scott gets, like, eaten by Dark Phoenix, who's apparently now just, you know, a split personality. Wasn't she like a cosmic being in the comics, or did I just completely mis misunderstand that? Anyway, Xavier dies, you know, again, we just have all this... I'm thinking they wanted to clear out, you know, to make room for a new ensemble. That's fine, but just... Don't just go trigger-happy and kill off major characters like that, especially if their deaths are completely meaningless. And they kind of were. You know, Scott's apparently been just completely distraught ever since the other movie. Now, I don't know if it's, you know, if this is supposed to be taking place in 2006 when it was made, and X2 was supposed to be taking place in 2003 when it was made, but that does kind of mean that he's been holding on to this grief for three years straight, unless, you know, he just decided to pick up the grief again before the cameras went on. I don't know. It's just, it's too easy, and it's again obvious Halle Berry wanted to be the new leader, so, you know, she wanted to be important in the movie. I'm not saying she wasn't important in the other two, because, yeah, but if you're gonna do that, make it less transparent. And Xavier goes, you know, and then we have the. In the other movies, when these power people don't use their powers, there's some kind of explanation. In this one, why does Magneto wait so long to, you know, be throwing the cars on fire? I know I already brought this up, but just think about it. Why? Yeah, why didn't he do it earlier? And can anybody explain that other than just bad writing? That's enough for this one, I swear. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.